First up is Where the Crawdads Sing. It's based on the 2018 novel by Delia Owens, and I guess Reese Witherspoon had picked the book for her book club, which is very smart because then she serves as producer on the film. So she's basically beta testing her pipeline and what she wants to make into a movie, etc., etc. Good job, Reese. I respect the business model. So based on a novel, I have not read said novel. I fully profess I knew almost nothing about the film going into it. I think I saw the trailer once and was just like, I don't know, just for lack of a better, like white people in the South and the marshes, North Carolina, something, something. But Daisy Edgar Jones was in it. And I was like, okay, I really like her. I'll check it out. Also, there are not a ton of wide popular movies opening this week. So, you know, here we are. It's the story of a girl who lives in a marsh and then gets accused of murder. And then I think the, the sort of tagline is like, oh, and the two men who came into her life and shaped it and blah, 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 blah. Okay, fine, whatever. So, Two men are played by Taylor John Smith, who I had not seen before, and Harris Dickinson, who I'd actually seen in a film called Beach Rats, which I thought he was really good in. It's also sort of strange to have two Brits playing North Carolinians, however you say, nor- people from North Carolina, especially swamp people, for lack of a better word. I don't know. But, you know, they, I actually think they do a fine job. So my problem with this film is that I have several problems with this film. Uh, I, you know, I didn't know what it was trying to be. I'm going to talk a tiny bit about the plot. It, you know, there's a murder mystery involved here. Where I was like, ooh, I'm invested in that. That could be really interesting. You know, go on. But then it's also sort of this idyllic romance. And, and uh, there's some tragedy. There's a lot of tragedy in it, too. But it's just a very glossy film in that sense. And, you know, for a person who lives in a swamp slash marsh and does her laundry, etc., her clothes are awfully clean. Uh, I, I know that's such a minor thing, but it just speaks to me of like the the level of immersion in this world where it's just like, no, we want to make sure that these characters have a sheen to them, even the douchey characters. And then there's also the problem. Uh, well, there's, again, more problems, but th- there are essentially like magical black characters in this, right? That, yes, I guess there's a logical plot reason for that, but I still don't love it. And then just to make things infinitely more complicated or add a layer of intrigue to it. So what I didn't know, and I almost wish I had known going into the film, is that I wanted to know more about Delia Owens, the author of the book, because she is apparently mixed up in some like questionable stuff. I guess she was a conservationist or supposed one in Africa for a while with her husband. Uh, They were in Zambia hunting poachers possibly and you know the whole story about where the crowd at sings is like a loner person who likes nature who you know gets accused of a murder in nature and etc etc and then it sounds like there's still I don't know if it's like an open warrant but there's still a big old asterisk on Delia Owens's name and in fact the the crime that she's involved in is a murder and I think it happened like while ABC was filming a documentary thing with her and so there's possible footage of this stuff there's some very fascinating backstory things the first thing I googled when I googled I was trying to find the runtime of the film but it was like oh is where the crawdads sing based on a true story and the Wikipedia or whatever the Google result is says no but now it's starting to feel like that she might have drawn more from her real life to infuse into this book slash now movie than uh, first anticipated. So that I almost wish I'd done because I'd be like, ooh, I wonder if she did this in Zambia and you know, but it's like she's here in the US now, so innocent until proven guilty. I don't know. But it, it was a fascinating twist that the movie itself did not earn my interest on that level on its own. That that I had problems with. So you know, we were flipping back and forth between this courtroom thing. Also, David Strathairn plays her lawyer, you know, who just sort of volunteers for it, which is like, okay, it's cool. That's, this is random. We don't say, it's also told like in flashbacks and all this stuff. And then you've got these characters, these actors who are probably in their t- late 20s, early 30s, etc., playing both teenage versions of themselves and adult versions of themselves. I thought Daisy Edgar Jones did that really well in Normal People. And I like sort of buy that for her but then there's some scenes where you know one of the boys is courting her and at some point it's like oh he's gonna go off to college I was like wait a minute how old are they supposed to be at this point like this doesn't make any sense but I guess easier than working with teen actors and then child whatever but ultimately it's a two-hour movie I wish it had been 90 minutes I wish they had cut down on honestly a lot of the like mushy supposed love stuff uh I don't 
I, it didn't read well to me. Um, you know, I also, I didn't get a ton of sense of chemistry between the characters. You know, there are, this is a movie that could have been solved by one conversation. And there are several like red herrings and all these things. And they try and give you clues along the way. But never did I feel satisfied. In fact, there, you know, it stayed at the very end uh, is what I'll say. And then there's like a, an info drop at the end. that I was like, what? I really wish you had told me this much earlier on instead of being like a uh, surprise cliffhanger or whatever it is because it just would have felt a lot better. I don't know. I just, the pacing, the, the the actors do okay with what they're given. I just feel like what they were given was not up to at least Daisy Edgar Jones's abilities and even David Strauss Theron. I don't know. It can't speak for what the book experience was like but I didn't feel like I was immersed in this world and I felt like it couldn't decide whether it wanted to be glossy clean and then have these like sort of for lack of a better word dirty moments but yeah I just I didn't have a great time I don't know how it would go if you were a fan of the book going into this I you know I I certainly hope for anybody going to see a movie especially a movie based on something that they are a fan of that they are rewarded by it but I would say maybe just stick to the book or if you are considering seeing the movie Maybe just read the book. It's a 2.2 out of 5 for me. Maybe just because a bump for Daisy Edgar Jones and a bump for... It was very pretty, but I don't need two hours of pretty and not plot and character development and all these things. And then next up is Persuasion, which is based on the Jane Austen novel. So we've got two adaptations this week. This one stars Dakota Johnson. So you've got Daisy Edgar Jones, who's a Brit playing an American in Where the Crowd Dads Sing. And then you've got Dakota Johnson, who's an American playing a Brit in Persuasion. What a, what a treat. Not a treat. It was not a treat. Actually, I thought, you know, I thought both of their accents, they, like, they held up well. I wasn't super, I didn't, I didn't notice at any point particularly. I, I feel like it was a little more obvious with Dakota Johnson just because in my head, she, her performance, even when she's trying to break outside of her usual sort of set of tricks, it, you know, I feel like she was trying to do that in Persuasion. It didn't quite get there for me. Uh, so based on the Jane Austen novel, again, I will have to admit, I have not read this particular Jane Austen novel, so I cannot speak to how faithful an adaptation it is. But you've got Dakota Johnson, who's, you know, the probably only sane member of a family. Her father's played by Richard E. Grant, who I loved. I thought was great in this. But he's Richard E. Grant. He's pretty much great in everything he does. Her sisters are played by Yolanda Kettle and Mia McKenna Bruce. And I got to, I mean, I'll give Mia McKenna Bruce credit, but her character is just so insufferable and so annoying. And it got very grating as the film went on. And then you've got Henry Golding and Cosmo Jarvis. Cosmo Jarvis plays Captain Frederick Wentworth, who was someone she was involved with in her youth. And then Henry Golding plays Mr. Elliot, who sort of comes in to possibly try and sweep her off her feet. You've got Nikki Amuka Bird as a family friend. And uh, again, we're, we're getting a little of the like magical, black characters slash only you know logical people in the film's territory again but there's more colorblind casting in this which I will so I will excuse that I will I don't think it was you know it's not as egregious as where the crowd had sing so anyway the thing with the Jane Austen novels is and adaptations of them I, I think the key element in it is you need chemistry between the leads and then everything else kind of falls away obviously the writing in and of itself is compelling otherwise we wouldn't keep adapting it but the thing that really brings it to life when you are adapting it for the screen is the chemistry and I didn't feel that with any of the characters in this which is such a bummer you know this is actually the third or fourth film like this that we've seen recently that has suffered from this you know Mr. Malcolm's List which was a Jane Austen wannabe had the same issue it's just it's starting to be a problem like do the chemistry reads please please like you they weren't hellbent on casting super famous people as the guys I love that Henry Golding is one of the male leads though that makes me really happy but clearly they weren't like we need you know the biggest names in Hollywood right now so find people who are like compatible with these characters it's just it's also one of those movies that and this is again it's I'm sure this is true of the source material where things could be solved with just one conversation right same goes for where the crowd adds sing but I feel it almost worse in this adaptation for persuasion and then also they do this thing there's a lot of to camera work that I feel like is very fleabag inspired other people pointed that out I'm not the first one to notice that it's trying to modernize it and I, I you know I feel like it's maybe doing a disservice. Not that you have to be the most faithful adaptation. I, I don't get the sense this is. You know, I think the great ones are ones that sort of change and make it their own. And this is trying to modernize it, but in like a how do you do fellow kids way in some senses. Um, it didn't quite work for me. 
Again, I thought Dakota Johnson was trying to break out of the same character that she's been playing a lot lately. She does a little bit, but just a little bit, not like an excessive amount. I think the accent actually helped here in sort of trying to, you know, distance it from some of the other stuff, but it just wasn't. Yeah, I really, I really wanted this to be spectacular. Like, I truly wanted it to be amazing. I wanted that, like, you know, Pride and Prejudice smolder moments or whatever it was. It just didn't quite land. I also think that, you know, there's a reason that Pride and Prejudice gets adapted constantly and Persuasion. It has had adaptations before, but it's not the one that everyone's like, ah, yes, her greatest work. (laughs) We're starting to get to the back of her literary works here. You know, it's fine. I don't think you'll have a bad time watching it, but I think for people who are truly fans of this genre, like it's not going to light that flame for you, right? It's, it's, and that's, that's almost more disappointing sometimes where you're just like, this could be so good. But if you are not super hardcore invested in this type of thing, you know, you're not like going to the Bridgerton ball type stuff. Like I think it's a fine film. It's on Netflix. So you don't have to go anywhere to see it. You know, it's not going to ask anything of you. So credit to that. I'll give it a 3.3 out of five. The next film I have is called Don't Make Me Go. It's out on Amazon Prime. It stars John Cho, and he plays an essentially single father who finds out that he has a terminal diagnosis, and he has a teenage daughter, and he's trying to, uh, you know, cram as much time in with her as possible, but doesn't tell her. And I'm, I don't know if that's a spoiler, but, like, this is... You want to talk about movies that could truly be solved by just, like, one sentence. One sentence conversation. It's this one. And I... I should have been bawling through this film. Like, I, the thought of it, it's just, it has the formula for me to just cry a lot. And I did not cry at all during the movie, which, you know, it's not to say that that is the litmus test, but I was truly expecting, like, I had put off watching it for days because I was like, I just need to be in, like, an okay emotional place if I'm going to take this on, all these things. Then I watched it, I was like, this has made me more annoyed than anything else, uh, than, than exerting emotions. So, in some senses, it's very successful in that it feels like it very genuinely captures teen angst slash annoyingness. And this is how I know I'm getting older, is that I identify more with the parents at this point than the angsty teens who are like, why don't you let me do this? Blah, blah, blah. I want to do that. I want to make this terrible decision. Like, you know, these boys are leading me the wrong way. You know, it's just all those things. I don't have children, but it, I, you know, you're just kind of like, ugh. Gross. Maybe that's a good thing. Not gross. But, you know, teenagers are, I was one once and I was annoying to deal with and I don't need to relive this, especially for sort of stubborn, you know, uh, somewhat selfish maybe. I don't know. But either way, the whole film, the premise of it hinges around this like horrible thing that the dad knows and the daughter doesn't. And and it's, you're just sitting there like, OK, I, at a certain point, you're the bad guy because you're not telling her like you're both the bad guys at this point. Who am I supposed to root for in this film? Not that you have to root for anyone. But this wants you to root for both of them. It's just, ugh. I'm getting more worked up than this film deserves. So <laughs> don't make me go. It's also long and and it's long and drawn out of the annoying parts and the sort of frustrating, you know, combative, angsty moments. The ones that are supposed to be joyous do not do a good enough job of counterbalancing and bringing any sort of sense of, to the film of like, oh, okay, like this, th- these are joyous moments. They will like cherish these memories or whatever it is. You know, it just like, it's, it's a downer. This movie is a downer, but not in the way it wants to be. It's a downer because it doesn't deliver on the way it wants to be. So, ah, ooh, it's got like a decent, you know, John Cho. I was like, okay, I'm in. Asian dad, gonna cry. Uh, Mia Isaac does a good job of the angsty part. Mitchell Hope, Jermaine Clement, Kaya Scodelario. Like, it's, a, you know, it's it's good. It's decent people. But I just didn't, I didn't connect with it. And I was, I don't know if I was disappointed by that because I had built it up so much and prepared and been like, all right, get ready for the tearjerker, ready for the waterworks. It's also, again, much like Persuasion, strangely, uh, trying to be cool. I think it does a decent job, it feels like, of capturing modern teenage hood and like how kids communicate but I also can't speak to that but it didn't feel overly like stylized in that it was like oh yeah euphoria is probably something where I'm just like I don't know what these children are saying to each other they're not actually children but you know what I mean so don't make me go don't make me watch it but I you know it's a shame because sometimes you want a really good ball your eyes out cry but this did not deliver that instead it just made me trudge through the teen angst so I'm only going to give it 2.6 out of 5. And then my last film is called Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris and again it was just a rough week for me and I 
I hate to say that, you know, I go into certain films and I know I'm not necessarily the intended audience for it. That doesn't mean I'm not capable of enjoying them. But sometimes I just know that there is a bet, there's an audience out there who this will hopefully resonate with better than me. And Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris is one of those where I'm like, oh, will it actually? I, I think Where the Crawdads Sing is another good example where I had limited expectations going in. But Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris, I was like, I don't know if the people who were really in the sweet spot for this, actually Persuasion is also a good example of this, where the people who really want to love this movie and are set up to love this movie, I don't know if they'll love the movie. So this one, another adaptation. So it follows a cleaning woman from London uh, who in the 1950s decides that she wants to own a Dior gown. Okay, sure. Uh, So the reason I wanted to watch this film is because of the cast. And I said, I know nothing about this movie, but I am interested in this cast. It's got Leslie Manville from Phantom Thread. It's got Isabelle Huppert. It's got Jason Isaacs. It's got Anna Chancellor. It's got Lucas Bravo, who I did not recognize for the life of me in it. And I realized he's from Emily in Paris. And I was like, oh, you have carved out a niche. Good for you. So Leslie Manville plays Mrs. Harris, who, you know, is just like your every woman So she has a a rude and horrible uh, upper crust noble or whatever it is, you know, employer. And she sees a Dior gown there and then she just gets it in her head that like she wants to own one. And there are supposed to be sort of themes about class and et cetera, et cetera. They get very lost in the film. There are a lot of sort of fantasy or fantasizing sequences about the fashion. And this is where I was like, oh, this doesn't speak to me personally. You know, I'm not someone who is a huge admirer of clothes and fashion and I don't maybe understand the homages to the original Christian Dior stuff that they're doing. I think none of the pieces in it are actual pieces. I think they're all like, you know, recreations or in the style of Dior. But I still have eyeballs and when I see something in a movie, sometimes you're just like, oh, I understand why this character would be obsessed with this. None of the fashion in this, I was just like, aha, You know, even the inspiring piece, I was like, this looks very cheap the way it's filmed. Now, if it had been on, whatever it is, like, you know, maybe it just, but I was just like, who cares? Not that, you know, not that who cares about fashion, but the pieces that they've chosen. I'm just like, who cares? Like, this is supposed to be the thing that this woman who is going to save up her entire life's worth, you know, like use all her savings, use whatever. And then there's this whole plot about like, where would she even wear it? Blah, blah, blah. And there's, so there's a bunch of stuff about classism. I think Leslie Manville is charming enough in it uh you know I think they've tried to make her character a little more down to earth than sometimes these uh I don't want to say matronly but these slightly older uh, protagonists get to be she gets to have fun which is nice she's not a prude about it I appreciated that but you know the entire time I was just like what who am I what's happening here like where do I and you know it's a two-hour movie as well and with 30 minutes to go I was like what is the where are we going here you know like we've accomplished xyz things who are we supposed to be And then there are also some issues with, I would say, like the gender dynamics of it. Uh, Isabel Huppert plays the president of Dior, essentially, and, you know, doesn't believe that a, a working class woman should be buying the goods there. And I'm sure that was like a real, you know, thing that was happening at the time. And this, this brand itself did have to pivot to a degree from uh, haute couture. <laughs> I'm trying to do my best French accent. Very bad, if you can't tell. But... I wish that, you know, the the strife between the characters had not been between two women and that it's a bunch of male characters who are often swooping in and like saving the day or proving themselves to be, you know, not what they cracked up to be. But either way, there's just something about the setup of that that disappointed me a little bit. And there's no reason that the character couldn't have been a, a male character. I don't know if it's based on a real character or something like that, but I was like, well, you, you know, there's no real Mrs. Harris, so it's a fictional movie. Like, let's, let's gussy this up a bit. Also, like, there's some side weird characters that, you know, you're supposed to root for and stuff like that, but I'm like, at one point I was like, I think a character is mansplaining existentialism and I'm not into it. I'm just not, I'm past that. I'm past that as an audience member. So overall, I think it, it falls into this category of I don't think you're going to hate it, but I think the people who would have been inclined to like it for the fashion, for whatever, like I hope you enjoy the film, right? I certainly hope that uh, you, as I said with the other, all the other movies this week, like I hope if this was for you, that you go out of it thinking, ah, yes, like I have a, I, I feel satisfied by this, but I in good conscience can't recommend it to like a wider, not fashion obsessed audience. 
I think if it was on in the background, maybe it'd be like an okay watch. But I'm not going to say rush out to a theater and see this. I'm sorry to say that. But, you know, if it was really good, I do think there's a version of this which could have been really good that was less focused on the the style and, the, and, and didn't have some of the characters be just sort of like, these two-dimensional representations of ideals. Uh, you know, they give, the model reads existential stuff. Okay, great. Like, we get it. You're trying to say that pretty girls can also be smart, but then the way they execute it doesn't, it's not great. It's not great. So I'm going to give it a 3.2 out of 5. 